Hello and welcome to worship with the First Congregational Church of Webster Groves. We are a member church of the United Church of Christ, located on the historic lands of the Osage and Missouri peoples. I am your literist, Sharon Love. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter, and today in the United Church of Christ is Mental Health Sunday. Please note that we have a special way to observe that after worship today, when Chad's coalition offers a training in the suicide prevention that will be conducted in the Memorial Hall after worship. Visitors, we're glad you're with us today, whether you're worshiping in person or streaming this service. Worshipers in person, I want to encourage you to take advantage of the friendship paths that are in your pews to acknowledge your attendance. Alternately, and this is for our online worshipers too, you can register your attendance by aiming the, your phone at the QR code on the screen just over there, which will take you to an attendance form. And this includes much information, you can include as much information as you wish. To prepare for worship, I invite you to center yourself by taking a deep breath and exhaling. Close your eyes and greet God's spirit here with me and there with you. Let our worship begin. Please join in reading our call of worship responsibly. We gather in the presence of God who has declared peace upon us. We gather in the presence of Jesus the Christ who has invited us to a covenant with God. We gather in the presence of the Spirit who sustains us in discipleship through challenges of hardship or joy. Now I invite you to rise, either in body or in spirit, and join me in unison for the raising of our covenant. We who are called of God into this Christian community covenant together to seek to know the will of God, to experience the joy and struggles of discipleship, to proclaim in word and deed the love of Christ, and to work for peace and justice among all people. We trust God's promise of grace and forgiveness and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our trials and rejoicing.
Now is the time we bring our stories before God. I have always been someone who feels compelled to fix other people's problems when they share them with me. Sometimes my advice is received well and sometimes not so much. This is my short story about being successful without giving advice. My niece and I have a very close relationship. Since she was a teenager, we have always talked about the cluster of issues that life threw her way. I've always tried to be the uncle or aunt who has the answers for her problems, and my niece has been very appreciative until she wasn't. At one point, my niece was going through a rough patch in her failing marriage, so she called me one afternoon and we talked for a while. As she was pouring her heart out to me, I was putting together my best fix-it solution for her. When she eventually paused, I started in on my advice. In the middle of my proposed solution, she stopped me. I was shocked. This is this has never happened before, but I will never forget what she said to me. Why must you try to fix everything? I just need you to listen to me. I felt like she had just thrown a bucket of ice water in my face. I did stop talking and I said, okay, I'm listening. My niece resumed her emotional processing and I grappled with how my fixing instincts had made her feel unheard. She later explained that everyone had been giving her unsolicited advice. She didn't need my advice. She needed my support. Please join me in a prayer of confession. God, in many ways, names, forgive us for our reactions that hurt others, ourselves and you. But more often than not, it's our inactions that inquire the people in the world. We are stymied by insular thinking, feeling chronically overwhelmed, sensing deeply a certain helplessness, and sometimes plain selfishness. Help us find the will, the energy, the time, and a desire to practice what we preach. Make us be bearers of your name, who don't simply profess to love our neighbors, but who demonstrably follow your command to do so. Align our faith with our lives, shape us to be the people who continually create kingdom of heaven. Amen. From that phone call with my niece, I learned that listening must precede advising, and that sometimes advice is not wanted at all. As James chapter 1, verse 19 says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. If you're like me, you desperately want to help the people you love. But sometimes help doesn't look like we assume it might. More often than not, our loved ones just want to be heard and comforted in their struggles. Love for us. Halle, 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 luya. Halle, halle, halle.
We are a forgiven and a forgiving people. I invite you to be seated as we move into the time for, well, not for children only. If you're a kid, you can be seated up here instead of in your pew. Good morning. Elaine, I love your earrings. <laughs> so this morning, I want to tell you guys about um, a section from the Bible. That is so cool. What is that? Putty. Oh, that looks so fun. It's sparkly putty, for those of you who can't see it. It's very special. Um, so in the book of Exodus, right here, in the beginning pretty close to the beginning of the Bible. There's um, a section in which God says, hey, I, these are my 10 rules for how people should treat each other and should treat God. And in, when you read it, it says that God told this guy Moses, these are the rules, and Moses then told everybody what God said, okay? And one of the rules, um, and the fancy name for the rules, is the Ten Commandments. Does that sound familiar? Yes, Sally. I totally remember that. Um, one of the rules is do not take God's name in vain, or don't misuse God's name. What the heck does that mean, Lane? Like, you can't say, like, oh, God. Can't say, oh, God. Anyone else? That's definitely what, what I learned, right? And a lot of people will say that, right? It means that you shouldn't say, oh God, or oh my God, when you're surprised or upset, right? Um, when I think of it, I think it maybe it has more to do with what we do than it does with what we say. You've probably heard that we are made in God's image. What do you think that means? How about this question? Are you made in your parents' image? Kind of. Do you like sort of resemble your parents? Does anyone ever say like you look like your mom or your dad? Or you have something in common with your mom or your dad? Yeah? Your, your dad likes to build things and so do you. Yeah, you have things in common with him. So something else that the Bible says is that we are made in God's image. We are kind of like God in some ways. So we represent God out in the world. What do I mean by that? So I'm a Christian, and that means I try to follow the way of Jesus in the way I live my life. But what if I treat people badly as a Christian? They're not just going to learn from that that I'm not very nice, but they might also take from that that God's not very nice either. If I'm supposed to be representing what God's like and I'm a jerk, people might think that God's a jerk too. Or what if I told someone that they had to do something because God says so? Then I would be using God to scare and control people. That's not good. I think using God's name in vain might mean being hurtful and sending a message that God is hurtful to. So you know that sometimes when we pray in church, we'll say things like, in Jesus' name, or in your name we pray, amen. I think that, that what we're saying when we say that is, God, help us be like you. Help us follow Jesus well. Help us live in a way that shows everybody that God is good and kind and loving and not bad or mean or scary. The way you treat people and how we represent God matters. Let's pray. God, help us live in a way that communicates that you love us, that you are good and kind. Help us represent you well. 
Amen. All right, girls, let's put our beanbags back and go to kids' church. A reading from the 12th chapter of the book of Exodus. The pastor spoke a lot about this text last week. This is the first four commandments, the ones about our relationship with God. God spoke all these words. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquities of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousand generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of Yahweh your God, for I am not acquitted anyone who misuses my name. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do your work, but the seventh day, is a Sabbath to Yahweh, your God. You shall not do any work, you, your children, your servants, your livestock, and the aliens residing in your towns. And here's a reading from, he shows goodwill tells the story, or the gospel according to John, the 12th chapter. I'm reading from the First Nations version of the New Testament in which the name of Jesus is translated, Creator Sets Free. A look of sorrow came over the face of Creator Sets Free, but now I am deeply troubled in anguish, he said. Should I ask my father to rescue me from this hour that has now come? No, I came into this world for this time and for this purpose. He then lifted his face, looked up to the sky, and sent his words to the Great Spirit. Father, he prayed, honor your name and show the world your beauty, the beauty of it. Suddenly a voice from above spoke out of the sky. I have honored my name, for it represents who I am, and I will once again honor and show the beauty of it. Hear the Spirit is saying, hear what the Spirit is saying to the people. Thanks be to God. You are probably confused that I am over here and not with the bells right now. I am pulling an audible. I would like to sing this African-American spiritual for you called Scandalize My Name before the sermon and afterwards the bells will appear in joyful praise. Well, I met my sister the other day Give her my right hand Just as soon as ever my back was turned, she took and scandalized my name. Do you call that a sister? No, no. You call that a sister? No, no. You call that a sister? No, no. Scandalize my name. Well, I met my brother the other day. Give him my right hand. Just as soon as ever my back was turned, he took and scandalized my name. Do you call that a brother? No, no. You call that a sister? 
No, no, you call that a brother? No, no, scandalize my name. Well, I met my preacher the other day, give him my right hand. But as soon as ever my back was turned, he took and scandalized my name. Do you call that a religion? No, no. You call that a religion? No, no. You call that a religion? No, no. Scandalize my name. I am innocent of the charges brought before me just then. <laughs> I promise you. <laughs> Quite the opposite, in fact. Let us pray. God, whose name is a mystery, I am. We dwell in you. We emerge from out of you. You are our source. And yet, every once in a while, it's helpful for us to come back together again and to think about who you are with us, in us, for us. So teach us well. as we seek to act in your name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> the way I had imagined this sermon to begin with, uh, it was very much like what Hallie just did with the children. And she and I talked about this a while ago, and so I said, you know what? you go ahead, you run with that. What does it mean for us to take on God's name for ourselves, to pray in God's name, Jesus' name, in the name of the Trinity? And instead, I want to go in, in, a, in a somewhat different direction, but still along the same lines. You see, over the last few weeks, what I've been doing is thinking about... Um, God's name. April 30th, the first time uh, in this series, I, I talked about God's name and, and the power and the wonder of that eternal affirmation, I am. And then uh, the following week, I talked about the importance of, of our own names, of especially those names, uh, the name by which we wish to be called or the names by which we wish to be called. It's important for us, you know? We, we have perhaps even a secret name that God uses with us. Um, Jesus, notorious for renaming people. Uh, easily half of his disciples are not remembered by the name their parents gave them, but by the name he gave them. I won't go back into that now, but it brought forward for me just how important it is for us to be called by the right name. Ironically, within an hour after preaching that sermon, one of you came to me and pointed out that we had misspelled your name in the new photo directory. And we're making the corrections. We're not issuing entirely new photo directories for everybody. We'll let people wonder, oh, who is it? Um, and in the meantime, what I will do is to tell you, I have that same problem. Nobody spells Danoon correctly the first time. 
The rest of my family, I am convinced, continue to spell it wrong with a capital N in the middle of it. <sighs> they think I'm pretentious. It's okay, you can laugh at that. But the importance of a name. And then last week I began talking about identity. Because all of this really focuses us on the identity of God. And in particular, as we spoke last week, that identity that we have because of God. As in the old TV westerns and um, inspirational movies in which a parent will say to the child, Remember who you are, and by implication, who I expect you to be. And that even for as coercive and as manipulative as that may sound for the parents in those shows, God says it to us as God's children, not in a coercive or a manipulative fashion but with love and just expectation, I think. So today, what, where I landed was to talk with you some, not about our identity, but about God's identity and how when we're thinking about who God is, or maybe not thinking about it and just uttering something that says who God is, we might be more mindful. Now, I'm not going to tell you not to cuss. There's not a whole lot that we can do sometimes about that except apologize afterward. Um, maybe, maybe there's some practice that, that we could adopt. I don't want to go into that right now. That, that would train us not to... Well, it's not so much, as Hallie said, taking God's name in vain, but misrepresenting who God is. There are some classic misrepresentations of who God is. I, uh, God is sometimes perceived as a tyrant, albeit a benevolent tyrant, one who is the dictator and gives us all of these commandments and tells us how to behave. That's one way of looking at God. I don't find it a particularly pleasant one, but that's one way of conceiving of who God is. And I think when we're younger, sometimes that's how it unfolds for us. Another possibility is that um, God is a disappointment. That we will have been told that we can expect certain things from God, certain ways in which our lives will unfold because of how we live ourselves in God's name. And when outcomes are unpleasant, a couple of things. Either God doesn't like us, and I've heard that a lot, God must not like me. This is why we can't have nice things, you know. Or maybe give up on God altogether. Possibly become an atheist, but sometimes just be opposed to God because you sense that God is opposed to you. In... Um, in Hinduism, the understanding, I'm turning slightly, sorry if that, would, if, if that seemed like a quantum shift. 
Um, in, in Hinduism, there is this idea of God. You may know that for Hindus, God is many different gods, but that there is a quality. Hello, Jean. <laughs> How good to see you. There is a quality of godness. Much as um, man is a category for all of humanity, it's an archaic use of the word man, but you know what I mean. God is a category of being also. So you have all of these different representations of God, and in any pantheistic religion, you have all of these different representations, but there is one understanding of what God is. In monotheism, we've done something different than that. And that is, in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, but especially in Islam, with this bit of calligraphy I have up here, it's also on the cover of your bulletin. I don't expect you to be able to read it, but I do want you to know that this figure here in the center, reading from right to left, is Allah. And Allah is the God of 99 names. There are 99 different names for God. They're not different personal names. They're different qualitative names. Um, let me see. Um, the God who creates. Um, the God who brings into being. Uh, the bestower of mercy. The ruler and governor. The most pure. The perfection and giver of peace. The giver of security. The almighty. And on and on and on around all three of those rings. So, you consider that my title for today might mean either that I'm rounding up a hundred names for God, or that I'm being a little bit flippant. Because of all those names, there is at least one, and actually more than one, that we use for God that are not here. Creator sets free, as we heard from the First Nations version of the New Testament a little while ago. Jesus, God saves, that's another name for God that we have that I promise you, although saving one is up there. Um, Holy Spirit is another one. The Holy is up here, but Holy Spirit is another way of thinking of God. Trinity is another name, really, that we use for God, not to be found there, three in one or one in three. These notions bring to mind for us how all-encompassing for our lives God can be, and that God is benevolent, God is merciful, God is loving, God is mighty in ways that we don't really expect, ways that don't look like the ways in which humans are mighty or powerful. But all of these names bring us to a ground that is rather in between the benevolent dictator and the one who's just so disappointing. This God for us instead offers a spectrum that runs from the one who can make a way out of no way, who can open up all sorts of possibilities for us, and we see our lives unfolding in time and space. To the God who maybe feels a bit distant, 
not necessarily one who set everything moving and then withdrew, but one who allows us to exercise our own measure of power and control and to let that have an effect upon the, the earth. Gardening. I'm thinking a lot about gardening today. It's so gorgeous outside. But that is one, if, if we're talking about one who is completely able to save, there's also the one who is completely able to let us be on our own and do what we need to do, who gives us a day off once a week, who's able to exercise power in that way, not just to control every little thing, This is the God of a hundred names. This is the God whom we come to know because our God is one and just so many faceted we can hardly understand. We live into an eternal mystery. I try to dwell somewhere in that middle And from my relationships and my conversations with all of you, I perceive that you do as well, or at least that you're trying to. And here's the thing. I think that some people want spectacle. Some some folks are really looking for God to be just this amazing platform, source out of which we spring all the time. And I think sometimes that's on us. I think sometimes the meaning that we bear God's name means that we're going to be taking on some of that responsibility. And we live in a world in which people are just sometimes so hopelessly at odds with each other. They think we'll never be able to get along. Now, here's the thing. Just as in Hinduism and in other pantheistic religions, You've got all of these different gods playing off with, you know, playing against each other and interacting with each other. That may make for an easier description of what's going on in the world than what we come up with, with one God who is great and almighty and powerful to to change everything and to correct our mistakes and You know, Sharon told us a story a little while ago in which what she had to hear was that she wasn't needed to fix somebody else's problem. You know, it's very godlike, not powerful, and, but, but giving up power. We need people to be like God. Not fixing everything. Not not making everything, but, but have you ever experienced prayer like this where you just needed God to hear what you had to say? Not to fix it, just to know it. That God is the God we worship. That God is the God we praise. That God is the one we walk with from day to day. That God is the one in whose name we pray.
I hope I've come closer to identifying for you who God might be for you. And if not, that I've just dwelt with you in a place that you also choose to dwell in. For we do this all in the name of our God, creator, redeemer, comforter, and sustainer. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our next piece, Joyful Praise, I'm just moved to explain to you that after that sermon, I feel compelled to say, to praise is to call on the name of God. And I think we'd like to show you another way to call the name of God, but not with words. We come to a time of prayer, and um, I have a microphone here that if you would like to voice a prayer either for joy or for concern aloud, uh, I will bring this to you and you can state it. Um, 
If you prefer instead to write it down on a card and to hand it to one of the ushers in the aisles, then they will hand it to me and I will read it. Um, while you're thinking about those, I have some prayers of my own that I want to say for joy and for concern. The first is um, the joy of our choirs and our music program. Uh, this was the last uh, performance of the um, bell choir, the Canterbury Bells, until this fall, and the um, chancel choir finished their season last month. So we are thankful for their work in prayer and praise and leadership in worship. Thank you all. They'll be back in the fall. Um, this morning, uh, as we are marking Mental Health Sunday, we do remember those, some of them very close to us, who are living with mental illness, and um, the people who take care of them, and the people who love them, sometimes the same people. Uh, we remember in prayer the Wenzin family, Paul Wenzin died this past Tuesday, and uh, we will be um, gathering to remember him uh, in about a week, in exactly a week, as a matter of fact. And finally, um, in, in my list here, uh, in addition to uh, unexpected but very, very welcome faces, um, we have uh, graduates uh, this week, and I'm looking at one of them. Joyce McCowan graduated from Eden Seminary on Friday night, and um, we celebrate her. <laughs> what other prayers have, do we have among us today for joy or for concern? heard of the incident that happened at a Deerberg's in Chesterfield the other day. The man that died was a classmate of Laz and I, mm. and we find ourselves thinking about all those incidents that happen when people lose control of their feelings and don't deal with their anger effectively. And I, I just find myself hoping that all of us think about when we're upset, when we take the name of God in vain, or express things in a way that hurts other people. Yeah. Thanks. A prayer of joy. Gary is home. She came home Thursday and uh, is learning to be independent again, Wonderful. which is not an easy thing with the adaptation she has to do, but she's glad to be there, and she's been greeted by many of the people there at the gardens and is looking forward to being her own self again. Wonderful. Thank you. Is there more? Let us continue in prayer. Dear God, we come to you in this time with all of these prayers that we've named upon our hearts and more. So many go unspoken in this moment. We lift our hearts to you, our world to you. You are the one to whom we turn in every need and never look in vain. You are the one on whose name we call and trust and find constancy in love, steadfast love. You may not always answer our prayers in the ways that we wish, 
Sometimes the world is made to turn differently than our will would call for in such cases as those. Teach us your love. Teach us to deal with one another and with our world in patience and trust, in caring and mercy. You have all the best names, all those blessed holy qualities on which we call are yours. You are endless resource. Guide us in your truth to ways of justice and peace. All of this we pray in the name of the one who came and taught us that we are your children, his siblings, and that all of us together might know you better if we would but pray as he did, saying, Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, loving God, in whose name is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe, the way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world, your heavenly will be done by all created beings your commonwealth of peace and freedom, sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Let us consider what God's Word today is prompting us to do. If you would like to make a donation toward the ministries of First Church, you'll find a brass plate on the small table in the narthex for monetary offerings. You can also give at our website on the donate page or use the QR code in your bulletin. Here are some other ways to give and share. Today after worship, as I mentioned earlier, our adult education session will be a signs of suicide, training by Chad's Coalition for Mental Health. The training will help participants to recognize when teenagers may be contemplating suicide and often ideas of what to do. This afternoon at three in the afternoon, the Zim, Zim, Xylem, sorry, I practiced that too. Xylem <laughs> Assembly will offer a family concert including a tale, of, tale in story and music, Peter and the Wolf. Reservations are recommended and there's still time to do so. See your bulletins for details. This Tuesday, women of the church are invited to join the lady elect for a potluck to celebrate the end of our program year here at the church. Happy hour at 6 p.m. and dinner at 6.30. Please don't miss the strengthening, strengthening the Church special offering flyer and envelope in this morning's bulletin. We will officially collect this offering next Sunday, which is Pentecost. 
Next Sunday afternoon at two o'clock, we will remember the life and service of Paul Wenzing, who died this past Tuesday. Visitation with family at Bop Chapel will take place on Saturday afternoon from two to six. Do we continue? Moderator Doug Baton also has asked for a moment to speak. Joan, would you mind coming up? When we had our last congregational meeting and there was a transition, um, we didn't get a chance to thank Joan and I think that's what we need to do right now. Joan, thank you so much for your service to our church. Thank you for leading us out of the, of the pandemic and bringing us back together. Thank you, thank you for your, your, your work on West Lockwood and the work you continue to do. Um, thank you for your mentorship, I greatly appreciate it. Everyone appreciates what you did and, and what you continue to do for this church. So we're so grateful to have you. As I said before, thank you for the opportunity to lead. It's been absolutely a pleasure. There are many more giving and gathering opportunities to read about in this morning's bulletin. Please be sure to give them your attention. Now, mindful of the praise we offer in giving and gathering, please stand, either in body or in spirit, to affirm our oneness in purpose and in spirit by joining in the doxology. all because of your compassion for us we offer these gifts so that your name may be glorified and all your world may be healed with this sign of commitment to your call we praise and thank you for the gift of kinship you have enabled in us through Jesus Christ our brothers amen
by whatever name you call the holy, the source, the one in whom we live and breathe and have our being, go. Go in that name. Live in that name. Teach others that name. Amen. Our worship has ended, but our service begins.